Well, now we get on to the mostly the, what I think is the is the part of this presentation that I've been looking forward to, and this is our our guest speaker, Jay Dickey. Um, and uh, I wrote a few words about Jay. So, uh, Jay's uh, he's been an active member of our society for about four years now, and he's acting as our counselor. Uh, he's also a member of another a number of other societies. Uh, uh, and uh, not only a member of the California Mayflower Society, but he's a member of the SAR, Sons of Union Veterans of Civil War, the Jamestown Society, uh, Flag and, and Trencher Society, and, and a number of uh, uh, the baronial order of uh, Magna Carta sureties uh, and the order of the House of Wex Wessex. Uh, Anyway, he belongs to a, a lot of organizations, and he does that because he is really interested in the history of these things. So I, I really look for, heard him speak on a number of these things. Uh, that really nice presentations. Uh, today he's going to talk about the uh, about King Philip's War. Uh, and, you know, I for years I'd heard about King Philip's War, but I did pay. I, knew roughly when it took place. And I knew I had some ancestors who participated in it. And most of us who have, have Mayflower ancestors uh, will have people along the way who were involved in uh, King Philip's War. Turns out, of course, as Jay's going to tell us, it was probably the bloodiest war ever fought on North American soil uh, in terms of the uh, percentage of, of uh, deaths and injury and uh, relative to the total population. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's quite an interesting story uh, that uh, affected American history itself. And so without a lot of further ado, uh, Jay, are you ready to present? I am ready so long as you can see my slide deck. Is it showing up on your screen? I see yes. it. Okay, very good. Uh, well, thank you, David. And uh, Suzanne is going to be um, standing by to take your questions. If you have questions as I'm talking, and if you know how to do it, please submit your questions on the chat, which is at the bottom of your uh, Zoom. And that way we can monitor questions. And if Suzanne feels so inclined or David, stop me. Uh, and ask a question. Otherwise, I'll take them at the at the end of my presentation. I did sort of promise David I would try to do this in 30 minutes. Uh, this is a big, complex subject, uh, but I'm going to try to do this and sprint through uh, the material here in about 30 minutes. So let's call it 11:30. If I go much past that, uh, David, kick me under the table, uh, and I'll try to wrap it up. Uh, there is a reading list that David circulated. I, I commend it to you because I have been reading lots and lots of books, both modern books and books that were written at the time or after King Philip's War uh, that really you know, speak to some of the issues that and concerns that uh, developed at the time and kind of in retrospect, uh, the uh, very contentious view on the war, why it took place, uh, and uh, what the outcome did to American history. And it did have profound impacts, even though I would guess most of us either didn't know about King Philip's War to begin with, or if we learned anything about it long ago, we've forgotten it. It really is a forgotten war, uh, but for the reasons I'll uh, talk about, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, a critical moment in American history. On the reading list, by the way, you'll see that the first book on there, many of you are probably familiar with Nathaniel Philbrick. He's written extensively on American history, wrote one of the great books about the Mayflower. When you read the book, half of it is about King Philip's War because he uh, looks at it somewhat through the lens of how did this happen 
from where we started with the Mayflower and Plymouth. And he goes through kind of a long dissertation about the tragedy of how you know, our Plymouth forebears uh, allowed uh, this uh, tragic circumstance to occur just decades after uh, Plymouth was first founded. He's done a talk on this, by the way, which I also commend to you. Uh, he did this with England Historical Genealogical Society, I want to say a couple of months ago. It's posted either on their website or somewhere. It's out there. Uh, so look for it. It's a very, you know, skillful dissection of the war uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, the beginning point, which is the Mayflower and Plymouth. I thought the most informative book to, as a kind of a starter course, I'll just kind of hold this up here, is the second book on that reading list, Eric Schultz's book entitled King Philip's War. So if you read nothing else, I actually would suggest you, you read that one. Okay, uh, where to start? So first of all, I'll start with this picture that you see on the uh, first page here. Uh, this is actually a rendering of King Philip done by none other than Paul Revere. Well, that's a long time later. Uh, years after, obviously, the conflict, uh, a, a fellow named Benjamin Church, who's an ancestor of mine, uh, he'd been keeping extensive uh, memoir material of his participation in the war, which ultimately was published by his son. And in the second edition, uh, somebody recruited Paul Revere to do this uh, rendering of King Philip. It's, it's become sort of the seminal image uh, of King Philip, albeit, albeit done you know, decades, decades, decades after the fact. Uh, so that's what that is. Uh, let me start at, at just following up on what David said. This truly was the most lethal war ever waged on American soil. Uh, it was just a devastating conflict on both sides. Uh, this data, I, I, I didn't ever think that the Department of Defense would have kept track of this kind of information, but it did. And you'll see in this chart, the most interesting being the right-hand column, deaths per 100,000. By far, King Philip's War was the most devastating lethal conflict. And you'll note it's just, it's not just American soil. World War II is down there as well. Uh, and while the sheer number of deaths, obviously in World War II, uh, eclipses King Philip's war on a percentage basis, it pales by comparison. And of course, the Native American uh, deaths, uh, you can see is just, you know, geometrically more than any other um, population uh, in American history, even the Civil War. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the beginning point on this. This was just such an American tragedy. How did it happen? So let me talk a little bit uh, about that, starting with who was King Philip. Uh, Philip wasn't his name. His name was Medicom, or uh, depending upon which historian you rely upon, Medicomet, and he was the son of Massasoit. Many of you who know, have your Mayflower history down know that he was the sachem, that's how it's pronounced, of the Wampanoag tribe. He was you know, a great friend of the pilgrims, some would say, Plymouth would not have survived but for Massasoit and, and the Wampanoags. Uh, Medicom was his son. Along the way, so in 1638, um, that's when he was born. When he was a younger man, he became Philip really on his own steam. He wasn't named Philip by anybody else. He decided to take a uh, a Christian name, not because he had converted to Christianity. I think that's a misconception. Uh, he took the name uh, along with his brother, Wamsutta, who also renamed himself Alexander. Uh, he then took over, Philip did, uh, as sachem of the Wapanogs after both his father uh, and his brother died. Uh, he didn't call himself king. Uh, the colonists, I, I, I truly think this was meant as a 
slap in the face. They called him King Philip because you know, he was exerting himself uh, in a powerful way, uh, some might say an obnoxious way, but in a powerful way. And so the English dubbed him King Philip. So that's how we get to King Philip. Uh, and it was shortly after he assumed uh, the role of sachem of the tribe that his people, his tribe began to agitate. Um, and of course, in the, in the decades before this, from the 1620s to 1660, a lot of adversity had started developing, often over uh, land, land grabs, however you want to define it, um, invasion of hunting grounds and all of that. So under Philip's leadership, they began to resist. And Plymouth Colony uh, was threatened by this to the degree that it was going to Philip really not, de not demanding yet, but uh, politely asking him to surrender his arms and subject himself to, to English law, which obviously was you know, uh, uh, a, a, big, a big ask of Philip uh, to do that, certainly in the face of all the controversies that were, that were swirling. Who was on the other side of this growing tension? Well, one of them, speaking of our Mayflower ancestors, was Josiah Winslow, son of Edward. Uh, he had, by 1673, become the governor of Plymouth Colony, very powerful uh, in that role and very much uh, an antagonist of the Native American tribes. It wasn't just the Wapanogs, there were the Narragansetts, Narragansetts and others. Uh, and he was not a friend of the Native American tribes. The most, um, I would say, uh, unspeakable thing that he presided over was the trial in 1675 of three Wapanogs, which led to their being hung by the neck. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but it was really that event that precipitated the war. Uh, before all of that, he, he was nominated and led the United Colonies. And then during the war, I'll talk about the Great Swamp Fight. He was literally on the horse with his sword at the Great Swamp Fight, which we'll talk about uh, as probably the worst of the battles that raged during this war, which did only lasted about a year, but it was uh, hellacious, as we'll talk about. So who are the other Mayflower sons and grandsons? As, as David said, probably all of us, whoever our Mayflower passenger is, there is a son, a grandson, uh, a great-grandson who fought in this war. And I've just done a very partial list here of some of them that I've you know, picked out of the lists of uh, soldiers uh, here and there. There were lots of different uh, towns, lots of different uh, uh, areas of New England that contributed soldiers and Mayflower descendants were really strewn around the landscape. But you had Josiah Standish, you had uh, the son of William Bradford, uh, son of Howland, et cetera. Uh, you go down that list, you see Benjamin Church, who I mentioned at the outset, uh, who wrote the, the memoir uh, about his, uh, his experiences during the war. He was the grandson of Richard Warren. Uh, I throw in John Gorham just because he's another ancestor of mine. Uh, Howland is, is one of my ancestors. Uh, and uh, <laughs> David, you'll chuckle at this, John Gorham's son, Shubail Gorham, ran a tavern, and it was through uh, Shubail that I became a member of the Flagon and Trencher. And David is uh, very uh, vigorously trying to join as we speak. It's a society that only descendants of tavern owners can belong to. So uh, my tavern owner, his father, John Gorham, was a captain uh, in that battle, son-in-law of John Howland. You'll see that Caleb Cook, uh, one of the, I think he's a grandson of Francis Cook, uh, importantly, uh, he was there at the very end when King Philip was killed, shot. Uh, there were two people who were there, just two, who confronted him. The first shot was by Caleb Cook, and he missed. 
So he didn't get the glory, as it were, of killing King Philip, uh, his Native American colleague who was there, uh, shot the fatal shot. So well before the war, and again, the, 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 the date is 1675, 1676, well before the war, for decades, the, the effort was underway, driven in the first instance by the Massachusetts Bay Colony. You know, the Puritans were much more uh, aggressive in trying to Christianize, convert the Native Americans than the Plymouth Pilgrims were. Uh, but uh, the, the, the effort was on for decades uh, to successfully convert the Native Americans. And I say here in the slide with little success, uh, you see to the right, the, the front page of John Eliot's translation of the Bible into the Massachusetts language. This was an effort uh, to further this, uh, this uh, really uh, concerted effort to uh, convert Native Americans by having uh, a Bible in their language. It was the first Bible actually printed in the New World. And John Eliot was just committed to the mission uh, ultimately unsuccessful. But as part of that effort, lots of schools were formed. Interestingly, Harvard University started out as an Indian school. Um, and uh, a number of Native Americans went to Harvard, uh, in including John Sassaman, who we'll talk about later, very important figure uh, in all of this. Oh, I should mention, there was a pejorative phrase used to describe some of the Native Americans who went to school. Uh, they were called prayer Indians, as in you've gone over to the other side and we don't like you. So a large contingent of Native Americans did not like uh, the Native Americans who actually did convert or were in the process of com converting. And so again, pejoratively, the prayer Indians were on one side of this uh, theological divide uh, that really did separate uh, the Wampanoags and other Native American tribes in New England. Roger Williams uh, played an important role here. You may know him uh, as the founder of what became Rhode Island. Uh, he was, uh, to, use a, to use a phrase, a bit of a rabble rouser uh, in New England. He started out uh, really protesting what uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Plymouth were up to in terms of the approach to the Native Americans, so much so that he was convicted of sedition in 1635. Remember, Massachusetts Bay got rolling in the 1630s and immediately confronted Williams. Uh, he ultimately uh, escaped, left town as it were, uh, went down south and founded the Providence Plantations uh, and really was, I think, the first uh, uh, man of religion, man of faith to start talking about the separation of church and state and religious freedom in a very overt way and a very confrontational way. Uh, with Massachusetts Bay and, and Plymouth. Uh, he did uh, assist the local tribes in the Pequot War. Some of you may know that uh, the, the King Philip's War was not the first war that erupted in New England. The, really the first one was the Pequot War and I think it was almost like one day, uh, but also a devastating uh, conflict for the Pequots. They were just, just horrifically massacred and, and uh, uh, left somewhat uh, um, uh, just, just a collapsed uh, tribe after the Pequot War was over. Williams and the Providence Plantations saw what was going on broadly speaking, including the enslavement of Native Americans, which was going on, either enslaved to serve their masters in New England or enslaved and sold in the West Indies, uh, where a lot of uh, trade was uh, taking place with New England. Uh, and so he caused the Providence Foundations to, to bring into uh, form a, a anti-slavery law. It was never enforced, 
uh, but not for lack of, of uh, good intentions there. He was a friend, clearly Roger Williams was of the Native American tribes, ironically, later became a captain in the militia during King Philip's war. I can't really reconcile that. I'm not sure historians can. Um, the native tribes were not kind to him. They burned down Providence and they burned his house down as part of the, uh, the effort to uh, combat um, the forces that were coming down upon them down in, uh, down in what's now Rhode Island. I like this quote from Williams. It kind of put an exclamation mark on his point of view and, and how he really uh, was adverse to the leadership in Massachusetts Bay um, and Plymouth. Boast not proud English of thy birth and blood. Thy brother Indian is by birth as good. Of one blood, of one blood God made him and thee and all as wise, as fair, as strong, as personal. Couldn't think of a stronger statement that the persecution of the Native Americans uh, was uh, problematic, I guess, to say the least. So Williams was out on the, on the forefront of efforts to stop the carnage, stop the enslavement, uh, change the course of uh, the colonial uh, attitude about Native Americans. Obviously, he failed. Some of the precursors to King Philip's War, there were many. I just highlight a few of them here with some of the timelines. I've mentioned the Pequot War, the Mystic Massacre. I was referring to earlier, hundreds and hundreds of Native Americans, uh, Pequots uh, massacred uh, in the Mystic Massacre. The United Colonies was formed in the face of the threats from the Native Americans. And this was basically the, the, the colonies banding together. You had Massachusetts Bay, you had Connecticut, you had uh, Plymouth. They came together in 1643 to get ready uh, for multiple conflicts that they were anticipating. The first thing they uh, confronted was trying or, or attempted to do was to co-opt the leaders of the major tribes. Uh, and in this example, you see here in 1662, literally at gunpoint, they took King Philip's brother, Alexander, uh, in chains to Plymouth to answer <laughs> for his uh, threatened uh, attacks on, on Plymouth. Uh, he was castigated, but he was released. Yet he died a few days later. Everybody amongst the tribes uh, suspected that he had been poisoned. But that was the end of Alexander. And that's when uh, Philip assumed the role of sachem for the, for the Wampanoags. Uh, it led to a, a, a immediately a peace between Philip and, and the then governor, Prince, uh, among others, to cease land sales, which had been such a source of controversy. The Indians arguing that they were being raped and pillaged through these uh, fictitious land grants and, and, and other uh, mischief that was taking place. Uh, years later, and this was just a few years before the war, Philip, like his brother, was dragged to Plymouth and not at gunpoint, but under threat of being overwhelmed by the colonial armies, forced to enter into a one-sided agreement, really disarm uh, and agree to abide by English law. It was a laydown. It was effectively a surrender by King Philip, and he uh, swallowed hard and did it. But uh, the resentment, the uh, seething rage about doing that, stayed with him and ultimately fueled uh, what happened in 1675. More tensions uh, that you see just summarized here. My reference to the Prayer Indians. Increasingly, this religious divide is is uh, fueling. Uh, uh, the, the call to arms, the westward expansion. Uh, and you see it in the literature. You see pamphlets being published constantly in New England and in London, but in New England, uh, really uh, uh, now uh, uh, vilifying Native Americans. Think of where we started with Plymouth, Massasoit, the, the friend of uh, the, the pilgrims. Think of that sense of 
of partnership. And now think of uh, the English just uh, a few decades later, you know, describing Native Americans as heathen, savages. Uh, it was a constant refrain in the literature and infected everybody among the colonists in terms of their attitudes towards the Native Americans. And all of these efforts to try to control Philip, it just really worsened the climate. It worsened his attitude as the leading sachem uh, about whether you know, continue to appease the colonists. I mentioned John Sassamon. Uh, his last name doesn't sound Native American, but he was uh, a Native American. He was fluent in English. He was extremely close to King Philip. Uh, he was an advisor. He was an interpreter. He was uh, a go-between uh, between Philip uh, and Plymouth. Uh, he was, uh, I would say, uh, inclined towards pacification, if that's the right word. He was inclined towards religious conversion. Uh, he did convert to Christianity under the, uh, uh, under the leadership of John Eliot, who published that Bible I talked about earlier, and he went to Harvard. So you would say, you know, a very uh, prominent player uh, in the relations between uh, the Wapanoags, the Native Americans, Plymouth, and Massachusetts Bay. Why do I highlight him? It was his death that precipitated the war. In January of 1675, uh, he goes to Plymouth. He has a relationship with Governor Winslow, and he basically says, watch out, Philip is arming and he's planning to attack, which was true. Uh, he makes it abundantly clear to Winslow that they ought to organize themselves. Winslow ignores him by all accounts. He took no, he took no serious uh, heed of what Sassaman said. The next thing that happens, well, he disappears, first of all, uh, but then he's found dead shortly after this meeting with uh, Winslow. He's found dead in a swamp. Actually, it was uh, winter. The body of water had frozen over. They found him under the ice, um, and they presumed that he had drowned uh, on his own initiative, not killed. However, six months later, the colonists, led by Winslow, decide that they're going to charge three Native Americans almost at random of murdering Sassamon. They drag them to Plymouth. There's a kangaroo court trial of the three Native Americans. All three of them are hung by the neck. Uh, somewhat miraculously, the rope on one of them breaks. And so one of the three survives and he is uh, uh, he, he is not rehung, as it were. He, he's killed later, but uh, in all events, the, the trial, the conviction, the hanging of these three Native Americans was the real, you know, final straw uh, for uh, for Philip. And almost immediately, the war begins. They launch attacks all over the immediate area. Small settlements small towns, there weren't any big towns, they were all small towns, unequipped to do battle, no forts, no militia, uh, no trained soldiers, just men, women, and children at the mercy of the Wapanogs and the other Native Americans who swarmed over their towns. So here is a, a kind of a crude map that was done at the time of New England. At the time that the war broke out, it's actually sideways if you were to invert the map, you'd see Cape Cod there down at the bottom. Uh, you'd see the Connecticut River up there at the top. You see Hartford called out on the river. You see Springfield called out on the river. You see the reference to the various tribes, the Narragansetts, the Pequots, et cetera. Uh, this was kind of the landscape at the time the war began. Lots of tribal villages interspersed with lots of small uh, settlements of colonists. Uh, the tribes themselves, uh, you know, besides having uh, declared war essentially on the colonists, they were at war with each other. 
And so, as you see in the slide, the Narragansetts were at war with the Wampanoags, the Mohegans were at war with the Pequots. Basically, all hell was breaking loose in New England in all directions. There was no safe place. Uh, as I said, the English settlements were very much unprotected, very remotely located, too. Uh, I just took this little summary here from a book that was written contemporaneously by Nathaniel Saltonstall. It's on your reading list. It's a very short read. You can find it uh, and download it for free uh, on the internet. Go to archives.org. It's on there. He wrote several uh, treatments of King Philip's war during the time period he was in the war. And you can see how he describes some of the mayhem in the various towns that he's listed here. Not one house left standing, uh, but one house left standing, none left, wholly laid in ashes, wholly ruined. And this last quote is just so chilling. Many have been destroyed with exquisite torments and most inhumane barbarities. Now, bear in mind, uh, and there's a great book, by the way, by Jill Laporte named The Name of War. One thing she highlights is that the history of this war was written by the colonists. There are no Native American treatments of the war. So we often get these kind of one-sided um, commentaries about the war, both from contemporaneous writers like Saltonstall uh, and others. But uh, at least this, this reflects, I would say, fairly the colonist view of what was happening there. Settlements were being destroyed. They were being pillaged, essentially, by uh, King Philip and his and his armies. I mentioned Benjamin Rush. Who was he? Uh, he actually was, you know, a Mayflower descendant. You see here the face page of of the history that uh, was written by uh, his son Thomas, based upon Benjamin's own arc, uh, own uh, uh, records. Uh, he was he was a shoemaker uh, of no particular importance or prominence who somehow, through sheer force of, of will, I think, became one of the leaders of the colonial armies that, uh, that, that fought King Philip. Uh, he was on the front lines of the great swamp fight, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, really changed the course of several important battles, including the Great Swamp. But very important guy, um, I guess I would say. And of all the people who were major actors uh, in the conflict, uh, he's certainly not only in the top 10, I put him in the top five of importance uh, in his role uh, as a, a leader of uh, the, the colonist forces. You can see all the battles that are flagged in this, uh, uh, in this depiction here uh, that was done by someone after the fact, uh, lots of uh, different uh, conflicts. And you can see Philip's death kind of uh, in small print there uh, above the word Rhode Island. That's where he ultimately was, was uh, chased down and, and killed. But uh, Philip and his army traveled all over this area, over to the Connecticut River, up north to almost the northern uh, border of Massachusetts. Uh, really, in a short period of time, uh, Philip, being chased by the colonists, covered a lot of territory uh, and pillaging villages along the way. I mentioned the Great Swamp Fights. This is a rendering of the fight. It's a little bit odd. Uh, Nathaniel Philbrick has this in his book, and he kind of is, is amused by the conical hats uh, shown on the soldiers there. I'm not sure that that's how they looked in real life, but this was uh, a rendering of it. With uh, you'll you'll see what looks like a fort up on the opposing hill, uh, commanded by uh, Native American warriors. Uh, this was what was dub dubbed the Great Swamp Fight. It was near Mount Hope, Rhode Island. Uh, it was uh, it, it was a massacre. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Native Americans were slaughtered. Uh, they burned the fort, including burning the uh, the wigwams of uh, women and children. Uh, many were beheaded, uh, and this was uh, th this goes down in history, I think, as one of the worst massacres of Native Americans that, that frankly ever occurred. Uh, I'm sad to say that, that 
Benjamin Church, my ancestor, was leading that fight. But but uh, a lot of blame goes around for the brutality of this particular conflict, which really I think uh, started uh, the the uh, reversal of fortunes for King Philip. He had been uh, quite successful in the war to this point in December 1675. Everything changed course after this war. And for the next six months, the battles raged, but uh, there was already an indication that, that Philip just could not sustain, uh, sustain this war against the combined forces of the United Colonies. Quickly, because I'm gonna start to run out of time here. Some of you may have heard of Mary Rowlandson. She was a figure in this, uh, became very, uh, her story became very popular, kind of a bestseller of the time. Uh, she was in the middle of the war. She was in one of the villages that was attacked uh, by, by Philip's armies and she was captured. After being shot, her family members killed, she was captured. Uh, she ended up being somewhat befriended by Philip. He, you know, he, he carried her along as they retreated and went through the, the wilds of New England. Mary was with him. Ultimately, uh, she was uh, released uh, a few months after her capture. And after being released, she wrote a book, again, a bestseller, The Sovereignty and Goodness of God, in which she recounts her experience as a uh, essentially a slave for, for two months uh, serving uh, King Philip. Uh, you see the cover there, again, available to download. Very interesting read, and it gives you a sense of the colonists' uh, view uh, of this war, which, as you can imagine, was viewing Philip and his armies as savages, murderers, uh, etc. The enemies are closing in by July, I'll skip over the February and April, by July, uh, my guy, Benjamin uh, Church, it shouldn't say Rush, it should say Church, convinces Plymouth to start converting some of the uh, tribes and bringing them over to the colonist side. He was successful in that. And now Philip was facing not just the combined forces of the colonists, but also Native American uh, helpers. And so this, uh, again, kind of cemented the, the, uh, the outcome. Uh, Philip just did not have the, uh, the resources to continue to fight, including a lack of food. Uh, as they traveled the, uh, the, the forests of New England, they were starving. Uh, resources were just you know, disappearing. And that's when Caleb Cook and his Native American uh, uh, partner, Finally, on August the 12th of 1676, cornered Philip uh, at Mount Hope, Rhode Island, and uh, uh, shot him dead. And this is Caleb Cook's, remember Francis Cook's uh, grandson. Uh, this is his quote. Uh, he was shot and killed on his face in the mud and water with his gun under him. And there's a etching that was done uh, depicting that. Somewhat horrifically, after he was killed, uh, they chopped up his body, uh, drawn and quartered, as they call it. Uh, the Native American who shot him took Philip's hand as a souvenir. And for years, uh, he took Philip's hand around in a, in a jar. Uh, I don't know what it was, formaldehyde or something. Took his hand around in a jar to various taverns, showing off Philip's hand. Really quite gruesome stuff. After his death, uh, his head, his severed head was taken to Plymouth. It was put on display and it was there for two years to, uh, to allow everybody to, uh, I guess, uh, relish uh, the, uh, the, the uh, victory over King Philip and his war. His wife and son were sold into slavery, just a horrible, uh, end to what was otherwise um, uh, an amazing uh, person, at, at least in his early years. Uh, the colonial leaders also started authorizing the indiscriminate killing of Native Americans, uh, hundreds over a period of years. And, uh, you know, the promise of peaceful coexistence that started with Mayflower and Plymouth really just, you know, 
could, couldn't be sustained, wasn't sustained. I was interested in this, and I'll skip over it again in the interest of time, happy to talk to people afterwards, but by the 1800s, Philip had become uh, mythological. Uh, he was, uh, plays were written about him, songs were written about him. He was kind of deified in some respect, not by the Native Americans, but by the, uh, the Americans living in New England. Uh, and as you see here during the Revolutionary War, uh, the, uh, the, the colonists fighting the British kind of likened what the British were doing to them to what the British did to King Philip, uh, which is kind of an odd uh, twist on it. But uh, indeed, there were lots of tracts written in which the, the colonists fighting the Revolutionary War embraced King Philip as as a, a role model of, of sorts. Here is two images I thought were, uh, I don't know, bittersweet. Uh, the left one is of the monument to King Philip that is down in Rhode Island in Mount Hope at the site of the battle where he was killed. And on the right, this, you know, I just think this awful image of how King Philip was uh, trivialized <laughs> into the name of a, uh, a bed and breakfast inn and the road named after him in Medicom Avenue. Uh, lots and lots of that all over New England still persists. So an inglorious outcome for King Philip by, you know, by anybody's reckoning. Uh, that's the end of my talk.